Hey, thanks for joining us at Connection Point Church. You know, we would love for you to stay connected and a simple way for you to do that is to subscribe so that each week you can get notified when new content goes live. We'd also love to keep in touch with you throughout the week and the best way to do this is through our Connection Point Facebook page. Now with all that being said, let's go to this week's message from one of our pastors, Zach Rainey. Jesus and mentoring, we're going to look in uh, the scripture, but before we do, I was uh, listening to a podcast. If you don't listen to Influence Magazine podcasts, then you're not as cool as I am. But I was listening to Matt Brown, an episode from 2019. He wrote a book called Truth Plus Love, The Jesus Way to Influence, and he said that truth and love are the two legs of the Christian. Without both, we don't get far. Truth and love. Because I, I can be really harsh on you about that's not true. We're going to have correct doctrine, we're correct practices. But if I don't have the practice of loving you, then I'm really not following the gospel. And yet if, if we always show his love and we never get around to the point of the truth, we have to have both legs uh, to stand upon, according to Matt Brown. And I think he's right. Because in pop culture and on social media right now, followers of Jesus are perceived and presented as bigoted, hate-mongering, fearful, vengeful, violent perverts. And that doesn't sound like truth and love to me. Where's the truth and love? And, and where will, I'm concerned about children and young people. And even those of you that are now 28 and remember being in my children's church. Where will you grow from immaturity to spiritual maturity without a picture of truth and love, without mentors that will come along? Because the most effective way to destroy this false narrative about Christians, we'll talk about that word Christians in a little bit, the most effective way to destroy that false narrative is for you to live out a genuine, non-hypocritical faith in Jesus Christ. That's how the next generation will learn the truth, through your example. And it takes all of us working together to accomplish that. If we're going to move from spiritual immaturity, I'm an expert on immaturity, by the way to spiritual maturity, then this generation needs to both see it in your actions and hear it in your teaching. Hear that gospel and see it in the lives of mature believers. So let's start by taking a look at Matthew chapter 16. Because I believe Jesus would, if, if you wanted to pick the best mentor you could, pick Jesus, right? Can we, can we do better than that? So let's look at Jesus' idea in Matthew chapter 16. Just for convenience, I will use the ESV today instead of some random Bible translation. But if you weren't here two weeks, three weeks ago, you don't know. <clears throat> it says in verse 24, you know, if you're opening up your Bible, save this as a bookmark because I'm going to come back to Matthew 16 in when the worship team comes up, that's their cue to come up is when I come back to this scripture. So. Verse 24, then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? So the outline will look like this today. When Jesus said, if any man would come after me, mentoring guides people in the right direction. He said, let him deny himself and take up his cross Mentoring requires self-sacrifice. Whoever would, uh, and follow me. Mentoring produces followers of Jesus 
And then whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life will find it. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits its soul? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? The, the fourth point says, mentoring changes my direction, transforms my ambitions and my aspirations and my desires, reframes my worldview, resets my life goals, consumes all of my resources, changes my values, and you always want this in your job description, and everything else. Well, that's where we're going. Jesus mentored his disciples just in every day what they did. You'll find sometimes they were sitting on a hillside and disciples would come and he, he was mentoring them. As they walked along, he was mentoring them. And as they were eating, he was sitting down at the table mentoring them. You should just count how many times they're eating something. Even they're walking through a field of, of grain. Let's eat some of that. You know, they're always eating Jesus believed in eating together. Amen. And <laughs> it ought to all have a big amen. And when, so when people say, oh, I can't be a mentor, but I'm going to show you that every single one of you needs to be a mentor. You need to be a disciple and a mentor. Every one of you. And people say, oh, I can't mentor. Well, can you eat? <laughs> yeah, but I don't know how to cook. Do you know how to wash dishes? Hire someone to cook. Get a friend. How many of you can find a friend that knows how to cook? Okay, you can mentor then, like Jesus. Anyway, we gotta get to the topic. Point A. <laughs> Mentoring guides people in the right direction. That, to me, that means I can live in a way that will direct people to Jesus. I can live in a way that directs people to Jesus. I wish I did it more often. Jesus guided his disciples in the right direction. So I think on the path from spiritual immaturity to spiritual maturity, it really helps if you're facing the right direction. Has anybody ever tried to walk backwards through Turkey Run? <laughs> I probably did when I was a kid. It's a lot helpfuler, uh, helpfuler. I made up a word. It just becomes more obvious where you need to go. It's simpler to navigate. It's easier to avoid the hazards. And Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, it could say, if you want, it could be interpreted, if you want to go after me. And so I have to ask you, what are you going after in life? A lot of people pick the wrong destination. And if you have the wrong destination, mind, you're on the wrong path anyway. When I talk to people, they say, oh, he's a Christian minister. He's got credentials. He's ordained. He's fully endorsed by the Assemblies of God for chaplaincy. He wants me to go to church. How many people that I talk to, they think that's my goal. I want them to go to church. And that's one of the first things out of their mouth. Well, we ought to get back to church. I ought to be going to church. It's not my goal to get you to go to church. That's the wrong destination. I want you to be like Jesus. If church helps you to be like Jesus, great, we're doing our job. I have actually been in church services where I didn't think it helped us to be like Jesus. Shame on us. So another wrong destination that I've been tempted is to use uh, mentoring as an opportunity to prove my worth. I've, I run into this in children's ministry. That's why people do children's ministry. It builds them up in some way of, to impress other people of their leadership skills because you can boss children around. You know, it's tougher to boss a group of men around, but you can boss children around. It's, that's the wrong goal, proving your leadership skills and impressing other people. This is not the goal of mentoring. Another wrong destination would be, well, you know, as a children's pastor, some people think my goal is to get them to sit still and listen. The truth is, all except for Logan Hudson, who my goal was to make him to sit still and listen, <laughs> all of the other children, my goal was to get you to be like Jesus. 
So, and a lot of people have thought that my goal in children's ministry, I do this a lot. I, I ask boys and girls to, to give their lives to Jesus Christ. And they think, well, that's his goal. That's my starting point. That's the starting point. My goal is not to get someone to bow their head, close their eyes, raise your hand, and accept Jesus as Savior. It's, it's probably the best possible place we could start this journey on the path from immaturity to spiritual maturity. But we have to get everybody pointed in the right direction. The direction is to be like Jesus, okay? You cannot mentor someone into a deeper walk with Jesus if you aren't guiding them in the right direction toward the right destination. And what is the objective? What's the object for spiritual mentoring? Ephesians chapter 4. This is a familiar passage. It has the apest in it. A-P-E-S-T stands for apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd, teacher. But I, I want you to, to note what it's really talking about. You know, we, we focus so much on those five mentor positions, I'll call them. Some people mentor like apostles, some like prophets, some like evangelists, some like shepherds, some like teachers. Okay, but look at this passage, how much it talks about just being a mature Christian. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried out by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love. There's a truth in love right in the middle of that. That goes back to the introduction. Speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. See, I need every one of you to be a mentor and to be a disciple. The Bible says this is the only way it works. It mentioned love in there twice, didn't it? Did you notice that? Because love is the capsule uh, that you can contain all of the working of the Holy Spirit. It ends up pointing towards love. So the, and to me, to, to love people perfectly, that is spiritual maturity. You think about it, a selfish person, immature, love is the exact opposite, to be unselfish. We'll talk about that in a minute. What if every program in Connection Point Church had only one objective? Instead of saying, you know, well, this program has this goal and this program has that goal. What if we just all had one single goal, one objective, to reproduce the character of Christ? What if the objective of every children's class, and God bless those children's workers that are sitting with your children right now, making them sit still. <laughs> no! Showing them what it's like to be a Christian. I've told you guys this before. One of the most important things that you will ever do in children's ministry is let a little child look at you and say, that man loves Jesus, and it impresses him for the best of their life. That's what a Christian looks like, you know. Anyway, back to, I'm getting back to things. What if every program just had that one objective, that by the end of that program, you were closer to Jesus. You were more like Jesus. Jesus. You were reproducing the character of Jesus in your life. What if every youth meeting, every small group, every men's meeting, every women's meeting, there's just one objective that we would sit down around one question and say, are you more like Jesus because you participated tonight? And that goes for this message today. One objective, are you more like Jesus? I think that'd be a good idea if we do that. Because Jesus said in John chapter 13, he talked about how people will know that you are his followers. He said, 
by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. To to me, that is the point of spiritual maturity, to love as Jesus loved. Once upon a time, before I came here to Lafayette, in a little church a couple of hours away from here, a couple of grandparents were so thrilled that their little grandson got to come to church on Sunday morning for the first time. It was a big privilege for them. And they had talked to him all about coming to church. They were very excited. And he sat in church and listened for a little while. And then when I stepped up to the pulpit, remember this is when I was skinny and had short hair, the little boy whispered to his grandparents, is that Jesus? God wants the world to look at you and see Jesus. They won't know you're his disciples because you have a bumper sticker on your car. I've wanted to tell some people, get the bumper sticker off your car. I just saw what you did. (laughs) False advertising. No, your driver's seat won't be empty if the rapture occurs. (laughs) I'm sorry, sir. They won't know you're a disciple because of your social media post, although mine are very awesome. Even if you put on your post, read that again. It doesn't matter. That's not how they'll know you're a follower of Jesus. They'll know you're a follower of Jesus because of your love. Mentoring people guides them in the right direction, and that right direction is the person of Jesus. Say this with me. I can live in a way that will direct people to Jesus. Say it with me. I can live in a way that will direct people to Jesus. But mentoring also requires self-sacrifice. Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. Jesus believes I can stop being selfish. And I wonder, did Jesus underestimate me? (laughs) Because I'm very selfish. Sorry, Liz, you already knew that. We sang it in the song, but John the Baptist said it. He must increase and I must decrease. See, a secular leader mentors because they want people to get in line and follow them. They want a parade and march in front of their parade, you know. Christian mentoring is exactly the opposite of that. You kind of want to put other people ahead of you so you can push them along, guide them along. Self-sacrifice requires us to identify with the crucifixion of Jesus. Jesus said, take up your cross. And it also requires... I know this of me anyway. In order for me to stop being so selfish, it would require the work of the Holy Spirit. To turn to Ephesians chapter 5 again, this is the the text from last uh, three weeks ago. I told you they cross paths so much, spiritual maturity, spiritual freedom. But in this passage, if you'll remember, I was comparing what it looks like to be a person who does not have spiritual freedom and someone who does. I was contrasting the person who is consumed with their selfish desires, their own selfish nature, and the person that has been set free by the Holy Spirit to do the work of God. So we saw that in Ephesians 5.16, he says, walk by the Spirit and you'll not gratify the desires of your flesh. Selfishness he's talking about. Then he gives a comparison of the things that are not like the Holy Spirit, like selfish stuff, like sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalry, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. And he sure has an awful long list of things that are pretty selfish, doesn't he? And then he says... um, Those won't inherit the kingdom of God, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. There it is. 
It, and it's singular, fruit is love. But all of these come under that topic of love. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. And what's the, what's the ninth fruit of the Spirit? Do you, can you see it? Self-control. Self -control. Can you control yourself? Well, not without the Holy Spirit's help sometimes. <laughs> Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So if we live by the Spirit, let's keep in step with the Spirit. Let's not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. A.W. Tozer in his book, Rut, Rot, Revival, he said something I memorized, and I don't have a good memory, but he said, if you want to be happy and nothing else, don't choose the spirit-filled life. <laughs> if that's all you care about in life is personal, selfish happiness, you don't want to be a follower of Jesus. You want to be a follower of self. We already talked about getting your head in the right direction. But selfishness is spiritually immature. Selfishness is the opposite of love. So love is not selfish. So here's the task of mentoring. The task of mentoring and discipleship is to make extraordinary, sanctified, willing, faithful Christians out of typical selfish, ungodly, stubborn human beings. That is impossible. It can't be done. I can conceive of no natural way for that to ever happen. As Billy Crystal said, it would take a miracle. Did Billy Crystal say that or did the other lady? Anyway. <laughs> Acts 1.8. It would take a miracle. Jesus knew that. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit. Acts 1.8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and all the way to Tippecanoe County. Jesus knew his disciples would need the miraculous, supernatural power of the Holy Spirit if they were going to deny themselves and take up their crosses. So when you're empowered by the Holy Spirit, you can Stop being selfish. Say this out loud with me. When I am empowered by the Holy Spirit, I can exercise self-control. And then whisper, stop being selfish. You can do it. But it would take a miracle. <laughs> but we've got a miracle. How many of you are glad we have the Holy Spirit to dwell in us? Ah. Uh. Mentoring produces followers of Jesus. Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. I am a follower of Jesus. So why don't, why don't you just say mentoring makes people Christians? Well, I'll tell you why. Christian, the word Christian is a bad word, that's why. <laughs> it didn't start out bad, but it is now. Uh, the word Christian only occurs in the New Testament well, you'd think it'd be in there a lot, wouldn't you? H have you guys read the New Testament? You'd think it'd be in there a lot, Christians, because I hear it all the time, you know. Are you a Christian? Do you have a Christian bumper sticker? Do you have a Christian T-shirt? I listen to Christian radio stations. I was listening to a Christian podcast, and I went to the Christian online bookstore, and I bought Christian books. And we've turned it into an adjective. It's never used as an adjective in the Bible. How many times do you think in the Bible? Anybody know? Hold up three fingers if you know. Three times, that's it. The word disciple occurs uh, 267 times. And there's one verse in the Bible that brings both those words together. Out of the three times the word Bible says Christian, out of the 267 times that it says dis disciple, it brings them together. It's Acts 11:26, And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. In the Bible, there is no difference between a disciple and a Christian. It's the same thing. 
If you are a Christian, you are a disciple. However, we expanded this label to include more than just disciples. We include people who would like to have the name of Christ, the name Christian, without any of the demands of discipleship. And some of us pastors have kind of led you guys to believe that a Christian is someone who's accepted Christ. As if the Great Commission said, go into all the world and make converts to Christianity. We thought that the main reason the church exists is to get people to invite Jesus into their hearts and say the sinner's prayer. And as I said earlier, that's just a starting point. Unfortunately, over time, the name Christian has evolved, the definition of it has evolved and become something that would be completely unrecognizable by the New Testament church. And as you walk around in the world today, you will find, you will meet people that have the name Christian without any of the obligations of discipleship, and it shouldn't be that way. Disciples are not a level up on Christians. They're the same thing. Christians are disciples. Disciples are followers of Jesus Christ. If you're not a follower of Jesus, you're not a Christian. I don't care where you were born or where you go to church. And a mentor and a disciple have to be headed in the same direction as Jesus. We used to sing a song, where he leads me, I will follow. So we have to keep following Jesus. You know, if, if you're following someone and you stumble because your Crocs have the straps on the front instead of on the back, I forgot to turn them around because I'm lazy. You know, you just slide your feet in. And it takes so much effort to put the straps to the back and then put the Crocs on. If you stumble, you can do two things. You can lay there and quit following or you can get back on your feet and start following again. We need to keep following Jesus. Say this with me. I must Keep following Jesus. Jesus said, whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? When you keep following Jesus, you will be transformed. Mentoring changes. My direction transforms my ambitions and my aspirations and my desires, reframes my worldview, resets my life goals, consumes all of my resources, changes my values and everything else. I must be transformed by Jesus. Who is Jesus? I wonder if I got time to go into this. What have I got left? Five minutes and 43 seconds. All right. Real quickly, I thought of some Jesuses that are really convenient to have around. The Pepto-Bismol Jesus, you know, when you feel yucky, you go looking for him. And you hope you can remember where you put him. And then there's the statue Jesus. He's real convenient. You know, you can pray to a statue because he never asks you to change yourself and doesn't ever call you to a life of holiness and righteousness. The statue's kind of cool. And I like the Amazon Jesus. I just set up my wish list of the stuff that I want him to give me, and he'll deliver them to my doorstep, even on Sunday. <laughs> Who is Jesus? In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus was mentoring his disciples. Matthew 16 is where we started. So we're going to head back there and find out how did Jesus get to the point where he says, it's going to cost you everything to follow me. He got there because of his interaction with one disciple, Simon Peter. Matthew 16, verse 13. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And Jesus said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, son of John. 
Barjona. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, now remember his name is Simon up to now, you are Peter. Petros means rock. My nephew, he, he told me that was his nickname in high school, Rocky. I said, get out. <laughs> oh, I laughed in his face. All right, Jesus said, I tell you, you are Peter. Everybody say rock. rock. And on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Peter in this passage, he confesses Jesus is the Christ. Christ means the anointed king. Jesus is the king. He's the son of a living God. What an amazing thing. And Jesus is still the Christ, anointed king. Son, and there is still a living God. But if you keep reading, you'll find out, and we're going to, that Peter, Simon, didn't, he did, that's not the only name that Jesus called him. After this amazing confession, um, if you ever, if you're going through any of the wrestling, the Aramaic word for rock is kephas, all right? So when you see Peter, Petros, or kephas in the book of Galatians especially, it's still rock. Anytime you see it, say rock. Say rock. Okay, now let's see what other name. Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. Peter's got a lot of nerve, doesn't he? I guess... You called me rock, now I've got a, the right to rebuke you, Jesus. I, I could not rebuke Jesus, <laughs> but he did. Okay, he began to rebuke Jesus, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. That doesn't mean rock. <laughs> And aren't you, I think Peter, he was probably really, really glad that the nickname Rock stuck. <laughs> uh, would you want to have that nickname? Rock or Satan? Anyway, Jesus said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me because you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Colossians chapter 3. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. What is your mind set on? Are you going to go after Jesus? What is your mind set on? In conclusion, those are the magical words, by the way. In conclusion. Remember what Jesus said, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. I say let's do this together. The best way to mentor is elbow to elbow. Let's do this together. If, if I am not behaving like Christ, if you see me not loving like Christ, I need you to come over and say, hey, Zach, I want to, I want to tell you something. You're, that wasn't very Christ-like what you did. And you need to have someone that's doing the same thing for you. We need to hold each other accountable. That doesn't look like Jesus, what you did. We also need to confess 
This is why we need to get together with people on a more, you know, sitting in church isn't good enough. We need to get together with somebody that we can say to somebody, say, Mel, man, today I didn't act like Jesus very much, you know. Will you pray with me? Because I want to do better than that. I want to deny myself, take up my cross, and follow Jesus all the way. And this starts by facing in the right direction, by giving yourself completely to Jesus Christ. If you don't belong to Jesus Christ, you need to. The greatest joy in life is to belong to Jesus. It isn't, it isn't always fun and games. It's the greatest calling in life. There's, there's got to be someone here this morning that God is speaking to you that you need to lay your life down and let it belong to Jesus. I, I wish I'd taken the time to tell you the disciples Jesus picked. It's like he looked for losers. <laughs> because he was going to transform them. If you have been using the excuse that you're going you're gonna, to, when you get more mature, you're going to give your life to Jesus. You're doing it wrong. The, we got to start in the right direction. You need to give your life to Jesus Christ. Ask him, forgive my sins. Be my Lord and Savior, my master, my king. Rule in my heart. And you need to do that today. Would you bow your heads? If that is you this morning, if, if God's speaking to you and this is the point in life where you're going to commit yourself to follow Jesus, we, we have all kinds of phrases in the church, get saved, you know, give your heart to Jesus, all those things. But it's just giving your life completely to God and letting Jesus consume it. If, this is, if God is speaking to you and this is your day, we want to, I want to pray with you. I'm trying to think whether I want you to stand up or come forward. We're all going to stand up. Let's all stand up. You might be standing next to someone that has just, has feeling, I need to commit myself to Jesus Christ. I've got to be saved. I've got to start following Jesus. Would you join hands with people next to you and I'm going to let you tug on the other person's hand, all right, and say, hey, pray with me this morning. Would you reach over and hold somebody's hand? And if they tug your hand, you're going to pray with them right now, okay? I'm not going to pray with them. You're going to pray with them to commit their life to Jesus Christ, all right? So let's all repeat this together. As you pray for whoever is tugged on your hand, close your eyes, bow your head. <laughs> Repeat after me. Dear Heavenly Father, you sent a Savior who died on the cross to take away my sins. I give my life to Jesus Christ. He is my Lord, my King. I belong to Jesus now. Amen. I have one last slide for all of us because we can do this together. We can do this together. Mentors, disciples, it's every one of us. It's not, it's not an extra category. We all do this. We can live in a way that will direct people to Jesus. We can stop being selfish. We can keep following Jesus and we can be transformed by Jesus. How many of you will do this with me? How many of you will, do, will say, I, I will be a disciple in a minute? How many of you, that ought to be all of us, raise your hand. I'll do this with you, Pastor Zach. When you're wrong, I'm going to tell you. No. <laughs> Thank you. I got that email, by the way. Say this with me. I can live in a way that will direct people to Jesus. 
if I stop being selfish and keep following Jesus so that I will be transformed by Jesus. Amen.